Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. We are so glad to have you with us for a very special Ask Us Anything. We have uh, been iterating, designing, and changing how we do this little by little each week, uh, getting feedback from you. And uh, this week, we have a very special episode, if we want to call them that, with three very special guests for us today. And uh, I'm going to give an intro on each one of them and introduce them. And then as uh, previously, like we've done, please you know, keep the questions coming and let us know what you would like to know from these guys. Uh, first up is Jeff Sandstrom. Uh, he started his career as a stu- in the studio as an independent music producer and engineer, eventually making his way to front of house for one of Christian Music's most popular artists, Chris Tomlin. Jeff has been a part of North Point Community Church in Atlanta since its beginning and has helped train and equip their volunteers and staff. Jeff has a heart for helping churches excel in audio production, and that originally led him to founding Sonnet House Ministries. Designed to provide church production teams uh, resources for technical training, creative communications, and for a spiritual connection to God and each other. Later, Sonnet House partnered with MXU to expand their reach and uh, both with a common purpose. Jeff has mixed for many of the largest Christian conferences in the U.S. and around the world. Joining us from Greenville, South Carolina, Jeff Sandstrom. How you doing, Jeff? I'm good. Thank you guys for having me. It's good to be here. Of course. Uh, thanks for being a part of today. Uh, so Jeff obviously has a lot of experience both in the industry um, and um, both mixing, working with teams. Um, I know you have primarily focused in front of house. Uh, is that correct? You have a little little experience in broadcast as well. Uh, what, uh, tell us yeah, a little, a little bit, about bit. That. more more experience lately in broadcast because we're trying to help churches get, get better with uh, just developing tools to make their front house mix, you know, better so that it translates better to a broadcast or online environment. Um, yeah. But most of the studio stuff that I was doing back in the day was more um, album production related. So it wasn't necessarily live broadcast, but um, sure, you know, understanding how a, uh, front of house mix translates to a broadcast environment has always been an important part of working with churches. And so, yeah, it's, it's, it's definitely been time lately to level up in that skill and uh, yeah. get better at making that happen. For sure. All right. Uh, next guest joining us today is Scott Ragsdale. Uh, after earning his degree in media communication from Webster University, he went on to be the audio director and front of house engineer for Life Christian Church in St. Louis, Missouri, where he also helped design and install their PA and recording studio. Uh, from there, Scott went on to be the audio director and front of house engineer for Willow Creek Community Church in Barrington, Illinois, that's a suburb of Chicago, for 14 years. Willow is just massive and has a state-of-the-art production system, something definitely to behold. Uh, After his tenure at Willow, Scott moved into touring and was the front of house engineer for award-winning blues guitarist Joe Bonamassa for over five years. Scott has made a career out of mixing for high-profile events, large worship services, large Christian and secular conferences where there are no second chances. Joining us from St. Louis, Missouri, Scott Ragsdale. How are you doing today, sir? Uh Hi, Ryan. Oh, I'm great. Thanks for letting me be here. Of course. No, glad to have you with us. I can't wait to pick your brain as well. Let me get our last guest introduced, and then we'll fire off with some questions to get it started. Uh, Brandon Kahn, uh, as most of us do, had a huge interest in audio from an early age. That's probably got what got most of us in trouble and into this industry to begin with. Uh, he started his career working for several sound companies and churches um, in the 1990s and early 2000s. He eventually moved uh, to Dallas, the Dallas-Fort Worth area in 2005 where he soon became involved at Gateway Church. He started as a volunteer running monitors for weekend services. As he served, he became more interested and found himself on staff within a year. Brandon ran monitors and front of house for nearly every event they had. Uh, around 2009, Brandon took a leadership role, which really helped him, uh, pushed him uh, to help form what Gateway Audio is today. Uh, today, Brandon is over audio at Gateway Church. Uh, he helps lead around 15 members of the audio team. Joining us from Fort Worth, Texas, Brandon Kahn. Hello, hey, Brandon. Hey, Ryan. Thanks for having me today. Of course. Where, where are you at uh, right now today? I'm actually Is that your house? Main, yeah, I'm at our... Yeah, I wish. <laughs> um, no, I'm at, it, our, I'm at our South Lake campus here. Uh, this is our primary broadcast campus. Uh, so, came up here and 
thought I'd give you a nice background. Fantastic. Thank you, sir. Uh, as always, joining us from previous weeks, we actually have Dan Page with us. So everybody wants to say hello to Dan Page. Hi, Dan Page. I think Dan's muted. Uh, and then we also have Kyle, our producer, who's probably pulling his hair out now with all the technical challenges we are throwing at you today. How you doing, Kyle? Good. All of our streams are now coming in a mismatched order. Let me see if I can get Dan back up there so we need to go to him later. Let's see. You're see not Dan Page. Face. Let's see. For whatever reason, I can't get rid of... Uh, We'll, we'll figure out how to get Dan on the screen. I can see him in the background. <laughs> he looks he looks great. If there's any questions about it, he looks great oh, today. Thank you, so I can tell you. Uh, so, uh, all right. So to jump and uh, start the question uh, off, uh, I just wanted each of you to tell a little bit about yourself, how you got started, how you ended up where you are, uh, something unique about your journey, uh, and maybe something important you learned along the way. Uh, Jeff, do you want to start us off and just... Tell us a little bit more about yourself and then something important you learned along the way. Sure. So I started uh, my I started all this as a musician uh, <laughs> rather than as a technician. I was a music major in college and uh, got to about the end of my sophomore into my junior year of university and realized that my friends who were older than me, who could play circles around me, were getting out of school, not getting jobs in orchestras. And uh, because they don't tell you when you sign up for a university conservatory that there aren't any jobs. So I, uh, True. I, I wisely kind of made the decision to try to find another area of interest in music where I might be able to make a living. So um, I was at the University of Michigan and they had just started a music technology program at the time. So mm -hmm. I took a couple of recording classes and got bitten by the production bug there and graduated with my music degree, but moved to Atlanta after college to uh, pursue working in recording studios. And so that's where I got started was basically on the other side of the glass um, as, a, as a producer engineer rather than as a performer. But I think being a musician has served me better yeah. than most things in my career because I'm mm -hmm. able to approach working with a band from a musical mindset. So I'm able to communicate yeah in a language that they understand and mm -hmm. talk about things in musical terms rather than just in, you know, kilohertz and decibels. And so that's really served me well over the years and um, has, you know, helped translate some of those things that sometimes get lost in the conversation. Um, but I do love music and I love mixing because I feel like, um, you know, my instrument is the band. I get to... Yeah. I get to play the band, and so it's yep. uh, it, it's been really fun. And then transitioning from the studio to live event and concert production happened through uh, being involved at church, actually. So I was mm. a part of North Point in Atlanta since its beginning and um, got to be around their super talented crew and their folks who at the time were pulling off things that you know, Willow Creek, where Scott was, was about the only other church that was doing things that were that innovative. And so mm -hmm. um, I got to see firsthand what a really first class live event team could look like. And mm -hmm. through that, got to know the folks at Passion Conferences and through them uh, was asked to be a part of several of their events and got to know Chris Tomlin at that point. So um started mixing for Chris front of house and Kyle was actually our monitor engineer at the time. So Kyle and I spent all those years together with, uh, Chris Tomlin and his band. And so I loved, you know, the time that Kyle and I got to spend together on either end of the snake. And, uh, and then when he joined up with you guys at Digico, it's just been, it's just been great to be a part of Digico's products and also the relationships with, with all of you guys through the years. So, um, is in terms awesome. of um, what was the other part of the question? Something that well, I would, I was two questions. What instrument was your was your principal instrument? Because okay, I was the trumpet major. <laughs> okay, fantastic. Yeah. Uh, so that that was just my curiosity. Um, yeah. But then uh, the uh, what did you learn along the way? Like what's something that you starting off as a musician, which I think you already covered, uh, in that you know you brought to mixing and to mixing the band, both in the studio and producing and live uh, at being a musician. 
Yeah, so I you're able of, to communicate with those musicians. But yeah, I think one of the things um, for sure as a mix engineer, um, I feel like learning how to think like a producer has been a really good skill that I've been able to develop. In other words, um, being able to communicate with the band about when an arrangement maybe isn't working or um, a part that they're trying to work out or even the key of the song. If, if there's something mm -hmm. musically that they're struggling with, I feel like you know, one of our goals should be to build enough trust between the front of house and the stage where the mm -hmm. artist could, whether it's a, a worship leader at a local church or uh, a touring artist at, in an arena, there should be enough mm -hmm. trust for the band to be able to come to us as engineers and ask how it's how it's working, how is it striking you, how is it how is it translating? Because you know when they're sort of focused on what's happening in their ears and they're trying to remember the arrangement of the song and maybe it's a new song. So they're trying to remember lyrics and all those things. They're not able to have the same perspective that we have. So for us to be able to communicate with them in such a way that, that um, communicates musically, but then also shows enough perspective, um, you know, because we've, we've got the PA, all they have is their in-ears. So we're mm -hmm. able to kind of create a culture of trust and communication that can be super helpful for helpful for what they're trying to deliver, uh, because yeah. really it's our job to facilitate what they're trying to communicate. Yep. Very cool. Thanks, Jeff. Uh, going on to Scott, uh, same kind of question for you, Scott. Um, you know, so is there anything we left out in the bio? Something you want to tell us? And you know, how how'd you start out? How'd you end up where you are? And then what's something important you learned along the way? Man, where'd I start? Um... I, I always like to say, I literally asked for my first drum set at age five, and mom and dad went out and bought this drum set from Sears or J.C. Penney, and it had the monkeys yeah. on the front of it, and it just oh, nice. beat it pieces, yeah, and I played drums pretty much through grade school and high school, um, mm -hmm. but when I was in high school, uh, one of my best friends was this amazing piano player, and mm -hmm. we went to see a local band, and I think when I saw a local band playing cover tunes, just blinders went on, like, that's what I want to do. And um, I ended up playing in a band when I was 18 years old. It was a polka and waltz band now. Got to love it. I'm in a German Fantastic. community. And, uh, Absolutely. But, but, but when I went to college, um, the, uh, one of the gentlemen in my electronics class was a lead singer in a cover rock band. And he found out I was a keyboard player and uh, joined his band. And I, so I played music for like 10 years, put myself to college awesome. playing music in a cover band. That's awesome. And yeah. kind of like Jeff, I think, I think the music background is roadmap into mixing because you know how to mm -hmm. respond, not mm -hmm. reacting, you're responding to the sound sources coming from the stage. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it was, it was kind of one of those strange things. I could never really figure out why music was such a, a draw to me, but later in life, I discovered that both my grandfathers were guitar players. So, oh, oh ta-da, there it is. Yep. It's in the family. Yep. Um, you know, and that, that, that's kind of the, the short of it. And once I graduated from college, uh, the girl I was dating was going to this charismatic church that had a full band. And I was like, what? You know, I grew up in a Baptist church in a very small town, mm -hmm. so you just had a piano. And mm -hmm. So I went to check it out, and lo and behold, they had a youth group that had this unbelievable band. Um, the first console I mixed on was a Tapco. Um, nice. And yeah, and just got into it, and just you mm -hmm. know, I'm playing music, but now I'm mixing music, and mm -hmm. man, this is this is a fit. This is working for mm -hmm. me. And also, like Jeff said, making music as a musician, well, that's a little difficult. So. Um, discovered the whole mixing thing was kind of working out way better. And so mm -hmm. ended up getting hired at this church and the rest is history. I, I just kept awesome. mixing. Um, we did some integrity projects uh, at the church in St. Louis. Um, offerings third day album, or, sorry, offering album by the band third day. Part of it was done with the recording studio that I helped build at this church. And so mm -hmm. a lot of fun interaction happened there. Um, then went off to work at Willow Creek, and that was an incredible experience. Um, got to uh, get invested in monitors, broadcast, front of house, just the gamut. Some incredibly just, talented yeah. people. And cool. you know, to 
to add to what you that last part of the question, what have I learned along the way? Um, I'm way over. Um, oh, I just went blank on me. Um, I, I like to be prepared. I'm way over prepared when I come into something. I like all the information. I like to be way ahead of the game, and it takes a really strong team. I mm -hmm. love surrounding myself with people way better than me, and mm -hmm. it, it it raises my game. And I always learn something. So. Um, awesome. I always try to, you know, yeah, surround myself with, with really talented people. And luckily I've, I found them and they're great friends and, uh, they keep me sharp. So that's the short of it. <laughs> awesome. Well, thanks. I appreciate that, Scott. Um, we've known each other for quite a while as well. I believe the first time we met was you were on staff at Willow Creek, right? Um, I was. We yeah. yeah, we were hosting, you were, I think, hosting what they called gurus of technology back in the day, right? Isn't that what they yeah, just, started, which that eventually great. morphed into Philo, but it's been great to know you over the years as well. So uh, next, uh, I'm going to actually move on to Brandon. Uh, same questions for you, Brandon. So did I cover everything in your bio? Is there anything you want to add? Um, and then what have you learned along the way um, as, as you've gotten here? Thanks, Ryan. Uh, yeah, so very similar to the other guys. Um, at an early age, um, in my family, we have a just a musical background. Mm -hmm. So uh, starting out, you know, early taking apart dad's tape player, uh, busting his speakers, taking them apart to see how they worked, mm -hmm. uh, things like that. Uh, playing around the computer and I'm sorry, around the piano with the family, mm -hmm. uh, just learning kind of the basics of music. Really growing up in it. Yeah. Um, and so to give a lot of credit to my family for, you know, growing me up in that, uh, mm -hmm. which kind of led me to the interest in, you know, music through high school, some music mm -hmm. in college. Um, I was a trumpet player as well. So I didn't realize Jeff and I have a connection there. Uh, so played trumpet through high school. Um, and then, you know, too. early ages, yeah, early ages, uh, in church, uh, you know, dad was a music minister, um, and I just kind of really had the connection with the audio side of things and I was mm -hmm. very interested in it. And, uh, so it kind of bit me about the age of, you know, 12, 12, 13, 14 years old, mm -hmm. um, really got involved volunteering and just sitting in the sound booth, watching the guys, mm -hmm. uh, just very interested in what they had to do and, and how that worked into the ministry side as the big, the whole picture yeah. uh, as part of that. So that was kind of my early, uh, stages. And then about, uh, you know, went through some college and then en ended up up here around 2006, uh, mm -hmm. attended found gateway through a friend that actually grew up with me, uh, back in East Texas. Uh, he was, he was the tech director at gateway at the time. And so he kind of brought me under his wing and, and let me volunteer some and, and, show that I had some chops. Uh, so I volunteered for a long time and then eventually uh, became a staff member. Uh, and yeah, so mixed as much as I could and uh, learned as much as I could. Um, of course, back in my early days, and I know the other guys are like this as well, but uh, did a lot of floor sweeping, a lot of cable rolling, right? A lot of gotcha. stuff that we don't really want to do. Uh, mm -hmm. which really uh, kind of set my heart and my, my mind straight and to really uh, appreciate all the different levels that we go through. Um, mm -hmm. So, yeah, so I'm here now. Uh, I've been leading the audio team here at Gateway for, for a while. Mm -hmm. And really, uh, you know, we're the whole team. These guys, um, they're amazing. So yeah. the whole team is awesome here. Great to work with everybody. Um so yeah, it's 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 really great to be here. So Fantastic. thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So uh, this is the first question I'm going to kind of throw out to all three of you. So um, kind of whoever wants to jump in and start first. Um, obviously, we're in some very odd times, uh, kind of unprecedented in many different respects. Uh, one of the things that have 
increased dramatically, uh, especially over here in the United States, um, is churches are continuing to do their services, but most of them have turned, uh, if they were not already doing streaming, they're doing it now. Um, and then those that were doing streaming are trying to up their game in the way they do that. So based on your experience, and maybe Brandon will start with you just because you happen to be sitting uh, in a broadcast studio uh, at your church, um, is there any advice that you would give to churches that, you know, maybe they've been broadcasting, um, they have, you know, obviously, or hopefully their attendance numbers online are way up during this time, um, and they're just kind of struggling. Um, is there any advice you would give to those guys um, that are in that position? Yeah, so um, here we're very fortunate to have, you know, a separate broadcast mix to be able mm -hmm. to send to the web. So, um, you know, we're fortunate to have that. Um there's there's many different ways that you can go about uh, mixing, obviously, for the web, whether it's front of house mix or a broadcast mix or an, a post mix. We've done all of these um, and they're all great. I would say that um, as far as content, like the mix levels, what you're going for online, if, if you're looking for a particular style um, for us, we always want to keep that lead vocal or the the. Um, pastor kind of on top right that's our primary mm -hmm. um thing to deal with and then everything else kind of fits under that and so and then your levels going out of the to the web as well you need to make sure they're a good volume and not over volume either uh to mm -hmm. fit within the different standards of all of the different platforms um so just concentrate on your primary things make sure they're heard and also uh reach out you know to people to give you feedback um, you know, listen online with you. Maybe that you mm -hmm. can send you a link to their service. Hey, give me some pointers. What did you think? Uh, was there too much reverb? What about the EQ on this? So uh, there's things you can do like that, you know, to kind of check yourself as well. So very cool. Yeah. Scott, uh, do you have anything, any advice that you would give? Um, I, would, I don't know if, uh, I mean, obviously Willow Creek has uh, been broadcasting and I think was early to the web streaming thing as well, uh, probably during your tenure there as well. So anything that you would want to add and share? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and listening to a lot of Zoom chats and people that are streaming right now, it, uh, I think checking your mix on all the devices that your audience might be listening through, like your especially like your computer speakers or your cell phone, um, you know, discovering. And just like Brandon was saying, your vocal intelligibility, just that's kind of really important. And make sure through all those devices, you know, the TV speakers, that it's really clear and it's, and it's happening. And, and that's a, you know, a pre thing, like do that before you send it out, like the best you can. Um, mm -hmm. I was, I also was talking to a friend of mine yesterday, uh, Ryan Pribble of Level Audio, and he does this for a living and he gave me a website. Um, it's www.atsc.org. And what was interesting about this website and some of the things they talked about was the level that you mix in your room is important to your end product. Because when you mix mm. loud, your ears actually change. So they actually have levels on this website about where you should be monitoring at when you're mixing for the platform you're mixing to. Mm. And I thought I was like, wow, that's incredible, you know. And so that's just another bit of advice I think I would throw in there. Fantastic. Thanks, Scott. Uh, Jeff, round yeah, us out so, on this one. What do you think? Yeah, we've been we've been through the MXU training that we're doing we've talked to a lot of churches in the last few weeks about I bet this, you have <laughs> about this very thing there are, especially for churches who uh have not focused much on streaming up to this point mm -hmm. it's been a real challenge because um you know they they may have gone so far as to maybe put their message on facebook live or uh take their message and edit it to be on a podcast or something like that, but there are a lot of churches who hadn't gotten to the point yet where they were doing their entire service online. So um, uh, some of it varies based on local restrictions and and you know the number of people that are allowed to gather and all that. But I think 
One thing that I've seen that's mm-hmm. encouraging is actually people who have been able to record in advance and not think in terms of necessarily gathering on a Sunday morning and doing what they always do live in the room and expect that it will just automatically translate to what people are experiencing online. I think Mm -hmm. we have an opportunity to really level up on our skill by recording the band in advance. And if you've never mixed for broadcast before, use tools Mm -hmm. like virtual sound check to be able to really listen to what you're doing and know that these sources really matter more than, more than ever, you know, Mm -hmm. mic placement, the quality of your drum tuning, the quality of your musicians playing in tune, you know, Mm -hmm. the stuff that might get forgiven acoustically in a room and through a big PA are going to be more exposed online because we have more detail. Um, You know, when we're listening on either headphones or smaller devices, some of those flaws might be a little more apparent than they would in a big forgiving yeah. room with a big PA. So mm-hmm. um, just remember that source really matters. Mic choice, mic placement, um, all of those things are crucially important. And I would also say, you know, pay attention to things like reverb. Um, because if we're in a big auditorium on a, on a weekend with a big PA, the room itself has a sound. If that goes away, then you might need to add more reverb than you think Mm -hmm. you normally would in the room to your broadcast mix. Um, Don't be afraid to use, you know, if if you have plugins at your disposal, don't be afraid to use a tuning plugin for a vocalist that might not be 100% there because that's going to be super exposed for people listening online. So, um, you know, I think in a way we have an opportunity to come out of this better than we went in. If yeah. we pay if we pay attention to some of these things, mm-hmm. so I mean, there's a lot we could talk about, but I think you know those so, those would be my few tips that I would lean so on. So let, let's dive into that a little bit more. Um, talking about the difference of putting reverb on a mix. If I was a live sound engineer uh, at a church or at a venue, um, and you're mentioning the room has a sound, the room has acoustic signature to it, um, and maybe I'm not used to putting reverb on things like the drum set. Maybe I just put it on the snare. Maybe I, maybe I don't. Uh, if it's really loud in the room, um, you know, the guitar player is probably swimming in reverb already. But that's a whole separate uh, discussion. Um, and so maybe I'm just used to putting it on the lead vocal. How do I go about building a mix and wh- what would you suggest should I just throw reverb on the whole thing should I put reverb on instruments individually what's what advice do you have about building a mix for broadcast that could have the sound of a room or a life to it well it depends if you're if you're mixing um, if you're doing all this production in the room if you're able to mm-hmm. actually be in your auditorium then mm-hmm. you could you could use room mics and you could with the PA on, even if it wasn't as loud as normal, you could mm-hmm. mic the sound of the room and put that under, you know, as, mm-hmm. as you would with audience mics, that kind of thing. Sure. You could treat that as, Give a, it some a, presence. as, as a regular yeah. input. Um, mm-hmm. If you don't have that and you're doing everything in post or doing everything sort of with the PA off, mm-hmm. then if you're, if you have virtual sound check and you're, you know, you're able to play back through, I, honestly, just experiment. I mean, I think, you know, you might want you, you might not want to have a ton of reverb on your kick drum, but you might have more on your toms or your snare than you normally would. Um, mm-hmm. Or you know, your acoustic guitar, your piano. A lot of those band instruments would definitely need it. Um, I think you know you still want it to sound live, like people are playing in the room together. Um, mm-hmm. But for sure, you know, vocal effects are going to be important, and uh, to to just make it feel like it's in some sort of space, I think is going to yeah. be a good a good thing. Okay, so really nothing is off limits. Just try something and see what gets you there. Whether it's something like audience mics in the room or putting a, a reverb on a lot of the instruments in the band um, across across the whole mix. I think so. Yeah, and yeah. and the other thing, I, you know, I think we have the opportunity to really, you know, maybe widen the stereo perspective um, mm-hmm. if, if we're in a room that's mono 
but we're recording now and broadcasting out. You know, if we're if our broadcast is a stereo send, then make sure that we're able to create some stereo imaging. Um, so for people who are on headphones, mm-hmm. you know, there is a sense of space. There is a sense of, you know, a left right image that is maybe a little different than mm-hmm. what they would get if they were just live in the room. Yeah. Cool. Ron, I think, uh, can I add something, Ryan? Uh, please do. Yeah, I just we discovered too that um, I love what Jeff's saying. Um, but know your platform because certain platforms are taking your stereo mix and they're summing them to mono, and they're guys are discovering that their hard pan guitars are canceling or things are disappearing. So make sure you're checking your mixes on a you know on a mono situation. And totally. know your platform because your your platform might be taking your stereo mix and summon it to mono, and now you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah, so definitely. Just wanted to throw that out there. Yeah, I had a um, an engineer uh, that was uh, they're basically touring around uh, and actually a band that Kyle mix monitors for as well, but they were doing a live broadcast event. Uh, so they were adding a broadcast console to this live tour where they typically just do front house and monitors. And uh, the, the gentleman who was mixing was the production manager. And uh, he uh, texts me and he's like, hey, are you listening to this thing? I was like, yeah, I actually have it pulled up. And he goes, is it mono? And, you know, I stuck my head up in front of the uh, the sound bar we have on our, our TV we were watching on. And I was like, oh, yeah, just totally mono. Just not not anything to it. And he's like, man, I don't even know why I bothered. You know, like... <laughs> <laughs> he was very frustrated. He's like, man, the mix sounds so good here. And uh, yeah, just absolutely crushed mono. So that's great advice, Scott. Uh, Brandon, let's pass that one off to you um, because uh, why don't you talk us through maybe specifically how you guys build your mix, uh, maybe starting with that kind of the sound of the room, the ambience, the space uh, as a starting point. Yeah, so we have um, we have the ability to mix um our broadcast mix several different ways. Um, early in the day, uh, before we had a separate console, uh, it was just a simple mix minus at front of house, which is basically everything at zero on an aux mix, vocals pushed plus five, um, and that translated very well online. Maybe some compression on it to, you know, mm-hmm. level it a little bit. And we actually still do that with services that don't require a large staff. So. Mm-hmm we're able to come up to broadcast and push up what's called the front of house feed, which is basically the mix minus from front of house. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's one way we create the mix that's going to the web. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other way is we have obviously our broadcast console here with all of the channels, the same source and uh, channel count that the other two consoles have sharing the same preamps, everything. And then we have about six, to eight different audience mics spread out in the room at different uh, places to be able to finesse those in and create that depth that we want. So uh, we also can do that at the the front of house mix, um, but they're just turned down to a level where it's not ever going to be kind of too much, you Mm -hmm. know? So uh, the broadcast, if there is a broadcast engineer up here, all of the uh, audience mics are on a, a group, and so we can bring the audience up and down based on what's going on. So mm-hmm. you have the end of a song, right? You have the audience build, press it and push it down, or pastors speaking. We don't have clapping right now, but if we did, they would yeah. they would bring up the audience and bring it back down. And I don't advise adding in like a fake audience clap either. So I think that could be translated. <laughs> in a weird way. That's just a personal <laughs> preference. Um, yeah. So like right now with what we're doing online, I don't know if you've heard it. If you, if you want to listen, it's actually a lot tighter and a, and a lot more intimate than a normal service would be. We've actually mm-hmm. kind of gotten rid of a lot of that spacious sound okay. um, to create, you know, everybody's in their living room watching. Um, yeah. And so to me, we've kind of made more of an intimate sound with everything mm-hmm. kind of pressed it down. Um, it's a little more, uh, not dry, but not as live, you Mm -hmm. know, we don't want to create that illusion that there is audience there. Right. So there's a very fine balance, um, of that. So, and then, you know, those are the type of different mixes that we can do. So it's, it's either a mix minus from front of house or it's a full broadcast mix up here. Someone riding the levels, 
you know, we're staying mm-hmm. in the 5 dB window the entire piece, and then we're riding those audience uh, faders up and down as they come in and out. So did that hey, answer? Your, Very cool. Much the, yeah. Sum it Ryan, up can I add to that one? I, I think Please Brandon do. made a great point about um, just the state of affairs right now. I think creating a, a, a more intimate moment is a great point, and I don't want people to, to gloss over that. I think mm-hmm. we have an opportunity, even even with video, you know, with, with nobody in the room, let's, let's move cameras closer to the stage. If you want to create a more cinematic look, you could maybe do more close-ups than you would be able to get away with um, – in a, mm-hmm. in a typical live stream where you want to sort of show the room and all that, you could maybe, so as you do that, as you bring people into the environment, so to speak, don't be afraid to let your mix kind of translate to that too. So mm-hmm. to, to have a more, um, a more intimate thing is, is probably good. I think even with instrumentation, I'm sure there are a lot of people who are not able to use the, the, normal complement of players that they normally would. So don't be afraid to experiment. You can be super dramatic and effective with a solo acoustic guitar and a vocal. And, yeah. you know, don't think that you have to do, you know, the, the whiz bang, 12 people on stage, Hillsong moment. This climate might not call for that. You might not be yeah. able to pull that off. So yeah. don't be afraid to do what only you can do, but do it really well. Very cool. Scott, anything on there? I think these guys nailed it. Um, <laughs> you know, Fantastic. And, 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 it's, and, and it's where we're at. The broadcast mix is where, where we're all living right now. So mm-hmm. just trying to you know, gather as much information as you can. Again, review your mixes on every platform and just you know, be intentional about knowing what's going on in all areas. So, yep. yeah. Sounds good. Uh, Brandon, I'm actually going to jump back to you for a question. Uh, it says, um, uh, one of the ones that we kind of thought through that would be good to share, um, your church obviously has a lot of campuses, a lot of engineers that come and mix between the various events that you have going on. Uh, and I'm going to assume you have a lot of different live streams that are coming out of those campuses. Uh, can you tell us about your church's approach to audio in general, uh, how you manage engineers, uh, how you support all those events? Uh, I, if I'm understanding, I think that's your role, a lot of what you're doing. And could you just talk us through that and what that looks like for you guys? Yeah, so um, audio in general, uh, it's very important, obviously. We we and the worship team create, you know, the experience, uh, live production. We're a part of live production. So the audio, Gateway Audio as a team, you know, we're all, we all have that same vision and we all have the mm-hmm. same goal uh, mm-hmm. to work as a team to create a sound that's pleasing. Um, and we all kind of agree on how we're going to do that. And one way we do that is obviously uh, we have our standards, you know, we have a full standards, you know, list from top to bottom on how we do things. And Mm -hmm. so we share those as a team. We're very transparent on those things. Um, And we want everybody to learn them and pass them down to the volunteers as well. So Mm -hmm. we have a lot of volunteers that help us um, Mm -hmm. in, in what we do. So, um, we may have a monitor board assistant, um, at every campus and a monitor board engineer at every campus that is a volunteer. Okay. And so the front of house engineer, which is probably the full-time person for that campus, their job is to lead those people. And so mm. they're leading them with our standards, uh, that we've all agreed on. And, um, so standards, to me, you got to have them, you know, mm-hmm. sit down with your team, come up with the top 10 things that matter. You know, we're going to communicate this way. We're going to share documentation through box or whatever. Um, we're going to do line check at this point. We're going to, you know, everything that you need to do should be done as a team. Everybody needs to agree um, mm-hmm. on it. And so, you know, team, the team aspect is huge, you know, standards, mm-hmm. the team, take audio out of it right if you yeah. don't have all that at the beginning and jeff's got a massive uh thing on on the team building stuff so like i suggest we're, we're, looking we're the going to him stuff. next on this for sure yeah so yeah. you know that is that's all to me um first 
and then mm-hmm. you know you work with your standards and then training you know we don't we don't put somebody at front of house immediately we would never do that and so we mm-hmm. want everybody to be mixing mm-hmm. front of house though so we don't want to we don't want to uh we want talent you know if you've got it bring it to us right so the way mm-hmm. we flesh that out is we start people out on stage um typically in like a monitor tech position and we want them as close to the source as we can we want them to meet the engineers we want them to meet the music the band members the vocalists the worship pastors we want them on the stage learning everything they can and so we get kind of two things out of that either they like it or they don't right so yep. you know, if they don't they're like they're scared they go on that's fine if they can find a different thing to do that's great but if they really love it they're they're at the right place and then they're with mm-hmm. the monitor engineer they're learning everything they can and eventually work themselves into a monitor board engineer position which mm-hmm. you know they monitors they excel in that and then we move people to front of house and broadcast so mm-hmm. we have a you know we have a path for each person if you will everybody yeah. kind of follows the same path whether whether full time engineer or volunteer we kind of want to run everybody through the same same way um very cool yeah that's kind of like a couple of the big things that i think kind of encapsulates gateway audio you know Mm -hmm. uh, we can talk in the weeds we can get in depth with how we do some things later but and i know you want to kind of go to jeff for the other stuff and and Mm -hmm. scott so i'll let them kind of speak into that side of it all right thanks brandon uh let's pick up jeff um so communicating with the team uh, I've heard you speak many times uh, and bring up this topic. I think it's something you're passionate about. You want to jump in there? Sure. So, uh, I mean, it's a deep it's a deep well of a topic. I think um, for anybody who's been around MXU before, I think you know we talk about this a lot. Just the importance of um, how we communicate and the need for communication. I think. Um, you know, there, there's two there's two sides to this. There's one about how we communicate with the band and the musicians, and then there's another of how we lead and train volunteers and communicate with kind of the audio team or the production team as a whole. And so, I would say for the, you know, for the audio training piece, I think it's it's about a lot more than just um, the mechanics of how a piece of gear works. I think there, especially in church, I think we Mm -hmm. have to inform everything with a why. Because Mm -hmm. if we just tell people how to execute a task, it's too easy for that to just become uh, non-relational and just a a transactional relationship. you know, I want you to volunteer mm-hmm. to execute this task, and we've raised the bar really high for a standard standard of excellence around here. And so, um, your job is to do this with no mistakes. Well, the problem is, your volunteer might be a dentist during the week, and if you're raising the bar that they should be a touring level audio professional, and they spend an hour a week at most behind this console. The opportunity for them to really excel and be a touring level professional quality engineer is pretty slim, but they do have mm-hmm. a level of a level of skill and a level of want to and a level of ability and relationship that they want to bring to the team. So, what if we cast vision in a different way? What if we clarified for them the why behind what we're doing? You know, create a bullseye mm-hmm. in the target that is different from. I don't want you to make any mistakes and you need to make your kick drum sound a certain way or you have to have this quality snare drum reverb. It's like those things are great, but they're not what's most important. I think if we can cast vision for them that they are um, partnering with us to help facilitate an environment of worship where people can take a step in their faith, then Mm -hmm. all of a sudden it's a broader view and it's, uh, okay, I'm not going to be so focused on looking down, trying not to miss the next cue. I'm going to be mm-hmm. head up, looking around, realizing that what I'm doing through this console is actually impacting the people around me. And then yeah. in terms of training, I would say I, I like to think of it as a multi-step process. If I'm the leader of the team, 
you know, we've we've talked about this around MXU a lot is, you know, we're going to start from a position that says, I do, you watch. Then I do, you help. Then you do, I help. Then you do, I watch. So there's, there's this transference of skill. There's this transference of leadership and execution so that over time, I'm not necessarily the gatekeeper of all the skill. I'm leading in an open-handed way that says, I want you to know everything I know about this process, whether it's a console, whether it's how to patch a stage, whether it's how to roll cable, whatever the task is, I'm going to be as open-handed with that as I can because I want you to know everything there is to know about this process. And as I transfer those skills to you, I'm also going to make sure to clarify the why behind it so that at the end of several months, I can just step back and let you do it so I can be prepared for what God has next for me or the next person in line that now you're going to be able to lead and teach because there's no better way to show how much you know something than to have to teach it to somebody else. So if we can create a culture of our staff and volunteers and production team members that says, yeah, there are things about this piece of gear, this console, this workflow, this stage that everybody has to know. You know, the standards are here. But as we talk about the standards, the skill in and of itself is not the point. The skill is just a means to an end. The end, Mm -hmm. the bullseye and the target is clarified in a different way. And so, you know, that's just a couple things, but we could talk all day about this kind of stuff. Yeah. For sure. Um, now, I would like to turn actually more specifically. I definitely appreciate the conversation we're having. I would try to like adjust it slightly. Um, Brandon, you mentioned this earlier, uh, talking about standards for um, a, really kind of everything as far as somebody on staff or somebody a volunteer should be doing. Uh, but Jeff, Brandon, and probably if we could throw in Scott here as well on this one, how do you go about getting four different engineers to come out with something that seems like the same mix. Uh, so like, let's say we had three or four volunteers, they may float in and out of something. I, it, this could work for front of house, this can work for broadcast. They're, they're in a position where you're asking them to be artistic and creative because that's what mixing is. But how do we set standards? How do we set a goal? How do we train them for, and how do we achieve consistency? Um, because obviously a large church or large organization doesn't want the mix to vary wildly from week to week or even the quality of that mix. Yeah. So two things right off the bat. One, um, every campus sounds identical and not every mix is identical. So they're close. Um, mm-hmm. We have kind of our sound that we're going with, mm-hmm. but we have a boundary and we also we want people to have freedom and freedom to make their own pushes and pulls and EQ changes and freedom to make mistakes. You know, I mean, we make mistakes. So that's kind of like, we'll say that first, we'll say, Hey, like you're going to make mistakes. We're here to learn together in this process. Um, you know, so we start there and then training, you know, training kind of comes over time, really. Uh, we don't have a lot of time to train people, obviously, during service. But we do, uh, for our staff members, we have a lot of time during the week uh, to play back tracks, uh, tweak things, listen to uh, MXU stuff or things online as a team, have team meetings. So we have all these different ways to learn and train Um, and then, you know, during sound checks and stuff like that on our Saturdays or before services, that's a big time to get with our volunteers and really show them some things on how to, how to do some things. Uh, so that's probably our best time to do, uh, training. Um, and then just the overall sound, how do we keep it the same? Uh, things like, you know, console sessions, we don't have 30,000 console sessions to be recalled during services we have one or two Mm -hmm. and we all kind of work off of the latest session so Mm -hmm. okay um, if one of our guys uh in front of house has the the front of house session going and he's been mixing for you know three months and let's say i or someone else comes in behind them we're going to pull their session and Mm -hmm. run off of that um because we don't know what's happened since the last time we showed up, right? So we want to, con- mm-hmm. you know, consistency there. Um, you know, 
sharing the same uh, input and output lists across campuses. So not that every campus needs to know what other campuses are doing, but the mm -hmm. same structure. So you, if you came from South Lake and you went over to one of our satellite campuses, you would automatically feel this is this goes for Gateway. No matter what we do, we want that feel, sound, family atmosphere everywhere we go, and so we're going to try to copy that at each campus. So if you go to satellite campuses and you walk in to front of house, you're going to feel very comfortable. It's going to feel like any other campus. Your playback system is going to be in the same place. Your I.O. is going to be set up the same, similar. Your naming structure, your console layout, all of that is all standardized um, across all campuses. And so, you know, little things like that will go a long way uh, mm -hmm. for the team. So especially when you're talking about volunteers, you want them to be comfortable. You don't want any kind of like, you know, what in the world's going on here? I don't understand where I'm at. So, yeah. you know, all the nomenclature and everything has got to consistently move across all campuses. So those are a few things that we do. Very cool. Real quick before we move on, how many campuses do you guys have? We have nine campuses. Uh, we have most of them are in Texas. We have one in Jackson Hole. Uh, right. And then one down in Houston. Uh, so, yeah, nine total and others to come so yeah fantastic scott let's jump to you on this one uh to kind of follow up with that um you obviously managed a lot of different volunteers and people swapping out uh, how did you help them aim for consistency uh and you know uh, obviously you, you want them to achieve the best that they can but you're obviously dealing with what jeff mentioned earlier very different or varying experience levels what what do you think um, I'm going to start with first the practical. Uh, keep your equipment the same and work from templates. Um, and that way everybody's got kind of the same starting place. That's kind of an easy practical thing to do and have somebody on top of it for all of your locations that the same console, the same speakers, you know, that's, that's actually really important. Um, the second thing is for me that made it work for me is have, have one person you're listening to on the quality of the mix. My guy was uh, Todd Elliott. I knew that I could ignore every voice coming to the front of house booth that told me it was too loud or the drums were too loud or, or what, what, whatever complaint came at me, it, I could ignore it because I mm -hmm. knew I had one guy in the room talking to leadership that I had to listen to. And that was consistent on anybody sitting in the seat. They knew that Todd was going to be the guy that would be the critique about the mix. Because, mm -hmm. man, the front of house is the hot seat. And um, you got to protect that person. Because in a church, you're mixing from age 2 to age 80. And everybody's yeah. got an opinion. And I know MixU has a very awesome uh, send in your uh, complaints. And they read them. And they're all real. <laughs> you know, they're, favorite they're favorite real. part of the podcast, for it sure. It happens. Yep. Yeah, it happens. So, you know, those are two. Um, I mean, Brandon's right. And really... Um, we're artists when we're mixing and there's no two mixes alike, but there's an acceptable quality, but have one person that the front of house guy has to answer to because mm -hmm. you'll just, they'll just get abused. So I'm just going to mm -hmm. leave it right there. I'm going to go to, go over to Jeff. Those are, those are all really great. And I think, you know, there's not much I would add except to say that I think it's important not only to have a a person who's responsible for being the gatekeeper, but to have, to have buy-in from leadership and to have trusted communication between the two so that, um, and, and I think to have a common sort of lexicon of terms, mm -hmm. because if somebody walks in and says it's too bright or muddy or harsh or loud or, punchy or thumpy or you know there's all these words that don't really mean anything mm -hmm. so for us as a team if somebody says boy that vocal seems really harsh what does that mean mm -hmm. and if we use the word harsh let's agree on is that we need to cut some 3k does that mean mm -hmm. we need to you know so there, there needs to be a common translation of those terms 
because yeah. otherwise it just gets lost in translation. And then I can't say enough about templates and you know workflows in that regard that you know there needs to be not just an ongoing show file like Brandon was talking about, but also a baseline that we can get back to. Mm-hmm. Um, my father-in-law used to mm-hmm. say the first rule of holes is when you find yourself in one, stop digging. So for those of you guys who feel like maybe you've dug yourself into a hole, whether it's a mm-hmm. workflow or you can't get this EQ on this drum kit right because over the last couple of months, people have just been messing with stuff and now it's out of whack. Okay, let's go back to our baseline starting point show file and just kind of see what may have changed that shouldn't have. I'd love mm-hmm. to have a situation where my show file is to the point where a volunteer could just come and push faders and walk mm-hmm. away feeling like they succeeded. So they don't yeah. have to know every nuance about EQ or compression. They just need to know, hey, this slidey thingy makes the volume louder or softer. I can do that and walk away feeling like I succeeded. So, mm-hmm. you know, those those are just a few things. But I think we're all kind of on the same the same page. Yeah, it sounds like it. Uh, real quick, Jeff, while I have you here, we've uh, talked about MXU a few times. Can you give us just a brief run- rundown on what that is and where people can find it and what, what resources are available to them? Sure. So MXU started um, as a live event. Um, it was January of 2016. Lee Fields and Andrew Stone and I decided to get together to talk about how we each approach different things about mixing as a way for us to get better. So we basically um, said, what if we just got consoles in a room, played back tracks, and got to ask each other questions about how we mix so that we could help ourselves just challenge and get better? Um, And then we thought, well, I bet other people would want to eavesdrop on that conversation. And so we got 100 people in the room and had a great day of just talking about mixing and thought, well, that might actually be a thing so we in the intervening time have done about 18 of those live events over the years Mm -hmm. we've also developed uh, an online training library of videos called mxu now that's Mm -hmm. a subscription-based thing where people can learn everything from basic microphone technique and signal flow all the way through you know, multi-band EQ and parallel compression. So um, it's beginner to advanced. So as a team leader of volunteers, we feel like it's a great resource to provide 101 level training all the way up to more advanced concepts. We're adding lighting and video content as well. And so all of the disciplines in church production will be covered. Um, So you can go to mxu.rocks and find out more about it. We also have a podcast um, where we have some special guests that we interview and have a lot of fun just talking about mixing and relationships and church production and barbecue and everything in between. So I'd love for you guys to check it out. Awesome. Cool. Hey, Kyle, do you have the, one of the comments I saw in there? Let me uh, push it up to the screen here. Uh, It's from John. It says two questions. Is everybody, is everyone streaming IP or anyone able to do DTV broadcast? Do you find differences between YouTube, Facebook, all those online streaming uh, platforms? What, what are your thoughts there? That's for everybody. Brandon, do you have to do anything with this side of things, or are you just trying to I basically think, send uh, out the same? I know that uh, LUFS is a big thing, right? Our levels going to the yes. different platforms. Um, Mm -hmm. It's something that I've really wanted to start digging into lately uh, to find out, you know, if you're over a threshold to this, let's say YouTube or or Facebook, I know that they'll smash the level, you know, Mm -hmm. which ends up sounding different. So um, I guess research with me and, 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 you know, find out what these levels need to be um, as far as the different platforms are concerned. I don't know that the quality uh, for what we do, the mix quality changes that much mm-hmm. from platform to platform. Um, but I do know that the level is a big thing. And so, you know, if you're way over level, then that could really put a damper on the overall sound. And do you, what do you have a target that you guys are trying to hit when you're outputting? So on Digico, we output at minus 15, uh, mm-hmm. on our master, our master bus. And then, okay. um, 
there's some uh, stuff that gets done to it on the video side of things. And then I think once it hits the web, it's like minus five dB. So, okay. yeah. Very cool. Brandon, are you, using, are you using any kind of loudness meter or um, LUFS monitoring when you're mixing? Not right now. We're just going off the console. And then we have an outboard piece of gear called um, an Optimod um, that kind of takes our level and kind of puts it at that uh, output maximum that we want to achieve uh, for the web. So we don't have, uh, at current, we're not using any kind of left stuff, but I am looking into that. And I've gotten really interested in it over the past three weeks. Um, now that we're, you know, caring more and more about this online stuff. So, um, it's really got me intrigued to learn more about it. So as of now, we're just look, watching our meters on the console. You know, we, we have our standard and, uh, it's pretty consistent from week to week if we stay in, within those parameters. So cool. Thank you. Uh, let's see here. What else you got, Kyle? Questions? I got one from uh, Matt Larson here. This is for Scott. It says, the smaller church may have one console and also need to feed a broadcast mix with a limited number of oxes or groups. I heard there is some sort of Oprah rack. Scott, what are the first <laughs> few key items to focus on for the smaller churches that has been forced to move to broadcast? Wow, Matt. Thanks. Um, I wish Chris Gilly was here. He's the one who designed that device. Um, what he's talking about is a multiband compressor that's after uh, the mix um, at Willow. And it, there's also a side chain that interjects audience mics at various times. So it's all automated. Um, again, uh, Chris Gilly is the, the, the man and the genius behind that. And it was very important because it kept all the levels consistent uh, going to the stream. And the automation on the audience mics at various times kept the, the feel of the uh, event very live. And it, it, it squashed those audience mics during moments of like band and things like that. So it didn't get too open and tightened everything up. Um, so that's about all I really want to speak into it because um, I would rather tip toss that over to the guy that, that designed it. But yeah, having something treating your mix going to the stream is important. And I'll just leave it there. <laughs> Sounds great. Uh, Kyle, do you have um, uh, Scott Fahey's comment? Yeah, just give me a second. Sure. Find that window. Click the button. There it is. Uh, how do you guys balance... <clears throat> so, um, do you want me to read go it? Go ahead, Kyle. Okay. Uh, yeah, please. How do you guys balance programming tracks with a live band? This is in... a. Uh, I'm guessing talking about broadcast, H how does that in the house compare to what's going to broadcast? First off, how, raise your hand if you do tracks along with a live band. So is everybody, yep, cool. All right, um, Jeff, why don't you start us off on this round? I think a lot of it depends on the arrangement and the program material itself. I think if you have a band that is trying to replicate uh, an EDM type style in a particular song, then obviously those tracks are going to be more at the forefront uh, coming from typically keyboard world like Ableton, an Ableton type setup. Um, sometimes uh, churches are using things like multitracks.com where they're supplementing parts that they can't cover on stage with uh, the actual instruments from the recording so mm -hmm. it depends i mean if you're if you're up on stage without a bass guitar player and you're using a bass guitar track from multi-tracks that's a different approach maybe than if you're just supplementing what your band is doing with some additional dj type edm tracks so mm -hmm. i think it's uh, you know uh, i'm not sure that i would necessarily change my approach i think I want whatever I do. I want the I want the instrumentation to serve the song. So mm -hmm. part of it is knowing from the worship leader what they're going for. Like why why are they giving me all these tracks? Are they trying to? Because the worst thing would be to have 
another acoustic guitar when we already have three acoustic guitars on stage. It's like, well, mm-hmm. okay, guys, which one do you want me to use? Mm-hmm. Whereas if you're if you're supplementing what you don't have on stage with some tracks, then talk to me about the reason why and what you're expecting from it. Like mm-hmm. we're maybe adding a B3 track because our piano player is playing piano, but we want the sound of that B3 for this gospel type song. Mm-hmm. So, um, you know, how again, the, the communication is key. But I think yeah. don't be afraid of tracks just because it's broadcast. I think if it if it serves the song well and if it's an important element musically to the song, then by all means, don't be afraid to use them. Cool. Scott? Yeah. Anything to add there? I mean, I'm going to go back to something Jeff said earlier about putting on your producer hat. It's, it's one of those judgment calls a lot of times when you've got tracks, and, and, and just like he was stating, sometimes the tracks you know, coming from Ableton or whatever has everything that's on the stage, and that can get a little weird. I think we've kind of lost space in music, and we try to stuff too much down the pipe. You know, It's like everything getting on the elevator at the same time. Mm. I think subtracting some of that stuff sometimes serves the song better. And again, that's a discussion um, with the worship leader and what they're trying to do and how that track fits. But if I've got an acoustic guitar player and there's an acoustic track, I don't use the acoustic track if the guy's really great on stage. Because to me, again, that's my call, but I wouldn't do it. I I choose the live musician over the track every single time. And um, yeah, it's just the way, and again, putting on that producer hat as an artist deciding, and again, sometimes uh, tracks can just fill up the space to where there's n- no room to breathe anymore. And I really like music to have dynamics. So that's my two cents to that discussion. Real quick, while, while you brought that up, um, Sir Scott Ragsdale, um, you, were, um, you, you called me at one point, uh, this has probably been a couple of years ago now, um, you were on tour uh, with Joe Bonamassa, and you, you, you were very happy about a change that was made uh, in your system. Um, so uh, for those of you who obviously don't know what we're talking about, um, you started touring. Was it an SD10 that you started with when you were touring uh, with yes. Joe? Yes, yes. It okay. was a 10 and, the whole time. Yeah, 10. Okay. So the console didn't change. Uh, you had SD racks. I remember you having maybe like a nano rack at front of house for some of the different um, the analog stuff that you had uh, there as well. Uh, but they were all 24-bit mic pre's when you started, right? Correct. Yeah. And how many years did you run with those pre's? Three. And were, were you happy with those pre's at the time? You know, it's what I had, and I made it work, and I thought it sounded mm-hmm. darn good. <laughs> I heard your mix a couple of times. I thought it sounded pretty good, too. But uh, tell me about why, why you were so excited with the switch. What changed? And Well, you know, I was discussing this with Kyle McMahon. Um, I was over in Europe, and, you know, we finished the leg of the tour over there and came back to the States. And I announced to me, uh, Jason Farah from SES switched out the rack to the 32-bit mic pre's, and I didn't know it. I was, I just walked out to front house, and uh, when the band came up for their sound check, I immediately knew something was different. I mean, it was like, okay, wait a minute. And I, I thought, is is it because I'm back in America? What's what's different here? You're like, why does this sound different? It's the it's power still is an different. But, right. Yeah, right. Well, yeah, <laughs> the power is different. I actually, I like the power in Europe better. But anyway, we'll, I think we, we all do go too. Down those, <laughs> we'll go down those roads. Um, but yeah, I, I immediately noticed just this more open and natural sound. I'm like, you know, and it, it puzzled me. And and I walked side stage, and then I saw them. I'm like, holy cow. There they are. And I called Jason, you know, and because he wasn't there to thank him. But yeah, the, the 32-bit my pre's were a game changer. Um, they absolutely uh, signal to noise, especially for IEMs, amazing mm-hmm. game changer. Um, I've, I mean, I mixed on Midas for years. And just those, those XL4 mic pre's, you know, just something about that signature of an analog mic pre is what I grew up on for many years. And when those 32 big mm-hmm. my priests came into play, I felt I was heading back into that world. Like, oh gosh, thank you. You know, uh, it, it's not sounding digital anymore. You know, it started mm-hmm. to sound like I, I remember it sounding. So 
Yeah, that that's kind of my story behind that. And I'm very thankful, you know, to the 32 Big Mike Prees. That, so, that, that was a good day. That's awesome. I'm glad to hear that. Uh, I'm going to actually pull in Dan real quick. Um, just, uh, I know you just did a video on this, didn't you, Dan? Uh, I did, yeah. Uh, went out this week on Facebook on Wednesday, I think, uh, all about 32-bit and why it's better, how we do 32-bit to 24-bit conversion. Uh, well, conversion cool. truncation, I suppose. Um, but yeah, absolutely. You know, transit response, speed of um, the speed of conversion, um, and ultimately the noise floor. You know, if you're having uh, a relatively quiet room, you know, not rock and rock and roll, but you know, theatres and house of worships and you know those sort of environments, lots of open mics. That reduction in noise floor, where we throw away the bottom eight bits and uh, and reduce the noise floor by you know 60 dB, uh, makes a makes a huge difference. It really does. Very cool. Uh, all right. Uh, let's see here. I think we have a couple more comments real quick. Yeah. So we've got uh, James Batera. Hey, buddy. How you doing there? Uh, Brandon hey, Khan. Jimmy. <laughs> yeah. Brandon Khan, do you guys have a summed mono mix on the desk you push to Facebook Live? That way you get the SD7 summing or does the summing to mono happen on the Facebook side? So... Uh, we do have different outputs that we send out to our video world uh, to be used in post if anyone wants to grab it and make it mono. Um, what, we, what we do on the upstream of things, on the mix side of things, is we have different ways to monitor the mix. So we have macros built on the console on the SD7 to put our, put our speakers either in stereo left, right, mono, that way we can kind of hear what it would sound like in the world if someone was to mono it up, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So we keep it in stereo, our mix is stereo, it goes out as a stereo stream, um, but we have different ways on the front end to monitor it. Uh, so we've got, we got our Focals, our HD1s, and our Aventones. So we have the ability to kind of solo up and simulate hey here's kind of what a, a laptop would sound like or a set of ipods would sound like versus a big set of speakers so we have ways to do that on the front end if that makes sense so mm -hmm. very cool um to do, to do uh, let's see here there were a couple other that uh, matt brought up that we needed to cover Mm -hmm. All right, this is probably actually a, maybe a good one for Jeff. Um, uh, let's see, I think Brian Norwood posted the comment. Do you have that one, Kyle? Uh, let me look. Um, how soon was it from, there it goes, it says help me. <laughs> oh, there we go, that. here he is. <laughs> <laughs> All right, <laughs> planning using the Waves loud, uh, using Waves loudest meter, meter and also I think new playlist writer will help me have control over different zones. Is that the one you're talking about? Yeah. Uh, so, and, and several actually other people brought up a WLM or Waves loudness meter. Jeff, do you have any experience with this particular Waves plugin? Have you jumped into this? Yeah. Um, I'm actually in the process of finishing up some mixes for um, the Orange Conference, which is coming up next week. And so I was. Mm -hmm in a text thread yesterday with some of the other guys who are mixing and okay, how are we going to deliver this stuff to the video team and all that? And it's, um, you know, we've, we're, I'm using waves loudness meter, uh, kind of as part of my left, right bus chain just to mm -hmm. check everything at the end. And so what we've basically agreed upon is, you know, Spotify, if, They'll normalize everything to minus 14 luffs. And so we're trying to live around that range for the entire program material, you know, trying to keep the, uh, the momentary uh, maybe around minus 12 at the most, uh, but minus 14 luffs and then true peak around, you know, no louder than minus two just to make sure that we've got some headroom from digital clipping. But it's a, it's a real balance between let's make it as loud as possible, but not so that it's going to distort and, you know, blow anybody's. I, I don't want, 
I don't want a provider, whether it's live stream or whether it's Facebook, YouTube, the church's website, whatever it is, I don't want any of those things to further squash what I'm already doing. So I'd rather, I'd rather give them something that's really close to what they'd like to receive at its loudest so that they're not further squashing um, and taking material away from what I'm trying to do dynamically. So, mm -hmm. but waves loudness meter is a good tool and there are a lot of details in it that I don't fully understand, but there are like, there are a lot of presets where you could set it to European standards, Netflix standards, you know, AES and EBU different, you know, measuring mm -hmm. sort of standards. Um, but it's a great way to see if you have any overs, if you have any digital, um, artifacts that aren't translating well, um, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's a good measurement tool. Very cool. Well, thank you for that. Yeah, I, I've, I've poked around in WLM before, but I've never actually uh, used it um, as part of my process. So very cool. Uh, what else should we get to, Kyle? You see anything or should I jump to oh, a few it. other so, questions? What is uh, from Brian? What is the biggest change you've made in your approach workflow to online mixes in the last few months? This is probably for all of you guys. Uh, Brandon, you want to start with this one? Uh, yeah, I know that um, a lot of our stuff online, because there's a lot of it, is being uh, mixed down in post. So you may hear a mix from broadcast. You may hear one that's mixed down from post. So I don't, you know, it's hard to tell which is which. I think um, we all communicate well and have kind of a, a well-rounded balance of uh, the levels and the and the mix what they should be so um, that's kind of been some of the approaches um, over the last month or so I know that like we can't have the staff that we had you know two months ago so you may have only two audio engineers show up at the campus to track or you know simulate a, a service so um, you have those challenges as well um, did that answer the question Hope so. Yeah, that, that answer. Yeah, Brian's I think so. Question. Yeah. Cool. Uh, let's take one more, and then we have a few other things to uh, to ramp up with there. So, uh, Rune, I think is his name. Kyle, do you have that one? Yeah, let me find it in my thread here. All right, coming up. Any thoughts on what kind of loudness range that is preferable from music? to speech on uh, streams. Brandon, I know you were mentioning that uh, you have like that front of house broadcast mix, um, you know, just mix from front of house where you, I think you said you set your vocals to plus five or something like that. Um, I think this question is getting into more of what's the difference between, hey, now my pastor is getting up and speaking and the, I know people have a, a, this question often. Um, so rather than vocal leading forward in the mix, all right, the songs and the worship's over. Now we're going to uh, the speaking portion. What do you guys, how do you handle that transition? What levels are you looking for uh, change-wise in that, if any? So, yeah, so we don't really want that big of a swing. We don't want people at home or in the car turning their volumes up and down, right? So mm -hmm. we do want to make sure with we're within that 5 dB range, the dy dynamics range. So broadcast if they're mixing up here, they don't have a whole lot of freedom to kind of go out of bounds with, with leads and things mm -hmm. when the band's going. So they're still pushing and pulling things, but overall the mix is within that five dB range. And then when the pastor comes up, you know, band down, pastor up, it's still going to go out the same level. Mm -hmm. uh, it's still going to hit the web and everything at the same level um, because of the leveling that's done in the outboard gear and there's some waves plug in, there's some L2s and stuff that are kind of keeping things at bay. So mm -hmm. as far as what you hear online, right, you shouldn't be really adjusting your volumes. Yeah. And then to achieve that, if you're doing a front of house mix, like you were just saying, um, you know, do an aux mix, a mix minus, where you've got vocals uh, and pasture and any kind of MC mic or anything like that, even playback music kind of pushed 
to plus five in that mix. That way, when you're mixing the front of house mix, it's an automatic bump for those channels on the web. And then maybe yeah. applying some compression to the overall mix might help as well. Yeah, because in a normal front of house mix, it would be it, it would seem odd actually to have vocals at the same level at, or the the pastor speaking for example at the same level that the band just got done uh performing at right so sure. we're, we're expecting a significant db change there but in broadcast it's exactly the opposite right we are trained to have everything in in that dynamic range so right cool, cool. all right uh, um, Ryan let's got see here. Is anything here? anybody wants to add to that? Okay. I've uh, got one from uh, Dominic. How do you approach getting a decent broadcast mix when you only have front of house console and don't have a separate console to handle feed for broadcast slash records? What would you consider a best approach for this scenario? So... Uh, let's see here. Uh, we'll just bat this around because Brandon, I know you covered uh, what you guys do uh, for you know some of the events where you don't have a full-time broadcast engineer there. So you take an aux mix, uh, kind of a mix minus uh, situation where you're sending. I would assume what band uh, is pretty much on one, and then uh, things like vocals, uh, et cetera, and speech on another. Or how do you have that set up? So it would be left, right. Yeah, it would be. Uh so if I'm at a satellite campus, let's say, because this happens at all of our satellite campuses where it might be a, uh, you know, you have your front of house mix and then you have a stereo aux mix built where everything's put to zero in that aux. And then the master of that aux is what's going out to feed your video con uh, video system or web. And so mm -hmm. you go to sends on fader for that mix and you want to bump up your lead vocals and your pasture in that mix you know, plus five dB or so. And then any other things, right? You're just going to have to listen back and say, oh, well, when I pushed the kick drum in the house, it was actually too much on the web, you know? So you might want to bump that down. You have to finesse kind of the overall mix, but doing it in an aux way allows you to finesse that. If you were to just take your left and right to the web or to video, you really have no control to change things on the fly. So... Um, doing sure. an, a mix minus is really the way to go. If you don't have, if you don't have the ability to have a separate broadcast mix. Yeah, Scott, what about you? Did you set it? Do you ever have to set it up that way? Or if you were in that situation, you don't have a broadcast console for an event. How would you go about building that mix? Yeah, in the early days of Willow, we were using one desk, um, and you just create, just like Brandon's saying, a music and a speech, and you treat those two signals differently, whether it's using mm -hmm. a matrix or however you want to split that signal coming out of your desk. And then on the stream, we usually had like a 6 dB difference between where the music was at and where the speech comes in. Um, mm -hmm. And how you treat those signals, you know, that's to taste. But that way, you've got uh, a relative way to treat each signal differently. So that's a simplistic mm -hmm. way to say it. using one console. Mm-hmm. Cool, uh, Jeff. So what's I think, your approach there? Yeah, I th I think there's there's two aspects to this. There's one about leveling the the relative level of speech and music, and then mm -hmm. there's another aspect about the quality of your mix in general. Mm -hmm. So I think you know, like I said at the very top of the call, I hope that all of us can come out of this crisis moment better than when we went in. Yeah. I think we have a great opportunity to really work on making this better. If you're, if you're limited by only having a front of house mix that's going to the web, man, record it often and listen to it everywhere so mm. that you can know, okay, if, if my broadcast mix doesn't have any kick drum or bass guitar, then I'm going to have to rethink the way I'm approaching this in my PA because obviously the mm. sub energy in the room is tricking me into thinking I have way more low end in my mix than I really do. Things like mm. that could be a really good learning that could come out of this. Or, boy, I feel like I have all this reverb in the room and it's not translating to my mix when I listen back. Okay, well, maybe that's the sound of your room that 
stuff's rolling around in a way and reflecting in a way that you might need to address your acoustics or you might need to address your PA deployment. Um, so it's it's a good opportunity because I really feel like if if a PA is properly deployed and a room is properly acoustically treated, that we should be able to get a pretty decent result from a board mix that sounds great in the PA that I could record and listen to like a board tape that you'd play on the bus after a concert Mm -hmm. and go, man, this sounds really good. You know? So I think for the, for the guys who are struggling, I would say record often use the, if, especially if you have a way to do virtual sound check, because then you can go back and make changes to individual inputs, um, to -hmm. really get to the point where, what you're hearing through your PA and what you're hearing through your in-ears or your headphones or your computer speaker or your phone is fairly consistent. And I think now that we have this margin of time, we have an opportunity to really get better at that. So I hope we do. Very cool. I'm sure we will soon. Um, Let's see here. Anybody else want to add anything back to that? Uh, I'll piggyback off of what Jeff was saying about the timing. Obviously, um, timing in your PA and the way that it's tuned is huge. If, if it's poorly done, then it's not going to really translate well online or to mm-hmm. a recorded mix. So um, that helps. Uh, I just want to kind of plus one on that. So make sure your PA and stuff, you know, your output of your console is kind of equaling what's in the house in some way, mm-hmm. whether that's measuring in smart, smart live or some other sort of RTA and uh, reference software so mm-hmm. yeah, that's a big one yeah awesome cool uh kyle any other questions we need to grab um no i don't think so i think we've c- covered most of it um fantastic we should it's talk my about, final go ahead uh, we do need to talk about what's coming up uh for next week which uh dan uh can you give us a heads up of uh what's uh what's coming up uh with digico next week I can. So um, tomorrow in our Locked Up with the Digico series, um, we have Freya Lawson, a young uh, female monitor engineer from the UK who has been locked up with SC11 and she has made uh, a video for us, uh, which is going out tomorrow. Uh, Monday's a day off. Tuesday, Fernando is doing uh, a Spanish session on multi-channels and set spill. Um, for any digital users out there, actually, multi-channels is a well underused um, uh, feature. So I encourage you all to have a look at that. And then looking towards this time next week, actually, a totally special occasion with uh, James Gordon and John Stadius from Digico, who um, this could be this could be great or uh, <laughs> or amusing or something else. But um, oh, it'll having, be amusing, Dan. It'll having, be amusing having I, the I pair think. of them. <laughs> Uh, available to take your questions next Friday night. So mm-hmm. um, I suggest for that one, you grab yourself a drink um, and settle down and think. You've got a week to think up some some questions for them, especially John. Oh, they're they're going to be awesome. Be Kyle's fingers great. are just getting warmed up. Yeah. So um, yeah. Cool. So plenty to look forward to in the coming week. I'm definitely coming back for that one. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be worth it. Um, let's see here. Kyle, do you have a slide for one of the next webinars we're going to be doing? Um, this is uh, very creatively entitled Digital Audio Protocols. Um, basically, we're taking a section of our Digico Master Series class, and we're going to bring it to you in a webinar format. Um, so we're going to have the registration up for this, hopefully either later, later today or first thing Monday. But we'll be sharing that on the Facebook page as well. So uh, please um, follow the links, register, join in. That event is going to be Wednesday at 1 o'clock Central in the U.S., um, which I think would put it at 7 o'clock uh, British summertime um, for you, those of you across the pond. Uh, a special piece, Jeff from Scott Ragsdale, Brandon Kahn. Thank you guys so much for taking the time out, spending it with us, answering these questions. Uh, and I just had one last question to before we sign off here for each of you. Um, short as long as you want to make it. Um, but I thought it would be fun to discuss because I know we have a few differing opinions on this. Um, plugins. Uh, yes. No. What's what's your philosophy on that? So uh, Jeff, why don't you kick us off? 
Uh, oh, and then we'll jump on to Scott and to Brandon. Why did you start with me? <laughs> it was on purpose. I'm sure it was. All right. Uh-huh. Well, you guys, most of you guys know that I do use plugins. Um, I, I think, um, I don't know. I think it's important to just to see plugins as a tool. It's not necessarily a magic bullet that is going to transform your mix into the latest hit record. Mm -hmm. It is a supplementary tool that might add a different color to what you're able to achieve Mm -hmm. from the console itself. So I don't ever want to imply that the console is not capable of delivering what it needs to deliver. Digico makes great products. Other manufacturers make great products. I think it's more about the archer than it is the arrow. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that's just sort of a blanket statement at the top, but there are things that a certain model of a vintage compressor or EQ can give you that may not necessarily be in a console, especially Mm -hmm. in some of the more budget friendly consoles. And so um, if I can have a waves card in a, in an X 32 and have access to things that an X 32 cannot give me, then uh, I would love to do that. Um, yeah. I don't know that I would make the same choices if I had an SD7 at my disposal. Mm-hmm. But, um, you know, all that's to say, I think, you know, the tools are there to be integrated. Now, with um, things like integrating waves externally to your console, you have mm-hmm. to understand things like latency. Time matters. And so if you're not comfortable with how some of this IO processing is going to affect the timing in your console, then tread lightly because you say, hey, I want to use this esoteric plug-in preset on my drums to have some parallel compression. And then you push up the Mm -hmm. fader and it sounds completely out of phase. Well, there's a problem with your alignment. And so you have to Mm -hmm. be aware of how that latency is managed in your console. But I would say as a tool... As a tool, I am a fan of plugins, and I'll stop. Awesome. Thank you. I appreciate that. Scott, what are what do you think? Are you a, a plugin user, or are you the uh, opposite camp? Well, I have used plugins, but I'm going to mm-hmm. say, based on my last tour, I did not use plugins. Um, okay. When I was able to use Waves six years ago, um, there was kind of a questionable issue of it crashing, and so... I was not comfortable with that, and I had many mm-hmm. other sound engineers around me that was it was basically it's not if it will crash, it's when it will crash, and I mm-hmm. can't do that. Also, you know, the artist I was mixing was a purist. Um, I was told mm-hmm. uh, personally by Joe to put no compression ever on his guitars, and as we know, compression's happening at the guitar anyway. So, you know, yes. I, I honored that, and it was fantastic. Mm-hmm. So I just kind of chose to use that nano rack, and I had real analog pieces i had a real 1176 i had a tube tech co1b i had a bercosti i had real pieces um Mm -hmm. and had you know latency was very minimal if any and like jeff was saying i mean the consoles are getting very powerful you guys just added that spice rack you know and it's given you a lot of internal stuff in those desks so Mm -hmm. for me i try to like really dig in artist specific here using the power of the desk and Mm -hmm. and i chose again to use real analog pieces on my last tour and had a lot of success but man waves is a tool it's not going away there and it's just you know plugins are a thing that we should always consider and so i that's you know where i would leave that question fantastic uh brandon why don't you round us out on that one and then we'll sign off yeah i totally agree with the guys uh 100 percent um, we do use waves here. We, uh, we love waves. We, uh, we have waves front of house uh, at all of our front of house positions, uh, except for a couple places. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, obviously broadcast, we have a waves system. Um, so yeah, we use waves, but we use them carefully, right? Mm-hmm. We, uh, even when you, when you talk about volunteerism, like it's probably not even a word that we use with them. Uh, obviously we don't use them at monitors at all from the latency 
issues that the guys were talking about. So, yeah, you just have to be smart with it. It's great products. Um, it's not for every instrument. Um, so we we kind of have you know our kind of baseline standards, what we put on a vocalist, you know how we do parallel drum compression. So we kind of as a team kind of agree on which plugins uh, we want to use where. Um, mm-hmm. and we also allow the freedom for the guys to try anything they want. Right. So mm-hmm. if they try something and it sounds phenomenal, then, then yeah, we'll look at standardizing that across. Um, but just like the guy said, like you could totally get a fantastic mix on all Digico platforms, um, without, without needing to use waves. So it's an enhancement for sure. So, yeah. um, yeah, so Ryan, can I add something? Sure. I I think one thing we need to get back to is just really listening. I'm seeing a lot of people, you know, we watch YouTube videos and we watch these things and we start applying a lot of processing before we've ever really listened to the original source. Mm. And, you know, it's kind of a, you know, a thing we just need to first turn it all off and listen to what the musician's giving us. Because, mm-hmm. you know, when we start implementing using plugins or any kind of uh, processing, um, it's changing that sound source. And yeah. I just really believed kind of getting back to the nature of supporting and reinforcing what the music- musicians are doing on the stage before we decide, you know, that we're going to slap, you know, three or four plugins on something without really listening to the original source. Um, yeah. Cause, so I just kind of want to leave it there. Awesome. Well, thank you all. Uh, let's uh, give a parting thoughts as we sign off. Jeff, is there anything else you'd like to add? No, I just totally agree with what Scott just said. In fact, the guy from Waves who wrote the code for the first plug-in is famous for saying, put the right microphone in the right place, turn it till it sounds good, and stop. And I think too many times, especially young guys, mm-hmm. just assume that you have to add processing to make things sound good i think it's way more important to think about the source and so um luckily things like 32-bit pre's and uh tools from digico help us make those sources sound better and better all the time so it's uh anyway it's thing it's all about the source i could not agree more jeff thank you for that scott any other parting thoughts yeah i'm gonna say hello yeah i'm gonna Hello to Camp. He he sent me a nice text here, and he's doing the Clang thing. So if you want to know about Clang, I'm going to throw that in there because that's a new tool we all should start investigating as as mm-hmm. is. And uh, I just want to thank you for letting me be a part of this. This was great, man. I really appreciate it. Awesome. Thanks for joining us, Scott. Brandon, uh, any any family members, anybody you need to say hi to? Uh, yeah, I guess my family. Hi. I guess they're all watching. Uh, and then. You know, all the Gateway Audio guys really make up this team here. And so, um, you know, we have social media accounts. We have our, our Facebook page, Gateway Audio, and Instagram as well. And so, and then anything with the church, gatewaypeople.com, uh, just go there if you need to find out any information on how we do church. Uh, we just had our 20th anniversary yesterday. So that's awesome. And uh, yeah, so thanks for having Fantastic. me. Fantastic. Appreciate it. Well, um, I'll leave everybody. We have a, an email address that uh, Kyle's going to throw up on the screen. Uh, and this is a great way to reach out to us. So if you have any questions that weren't answered, uh, any maybe something for one of the specific panelists we had, so you would like to get in touch with them, or you'd like to get in touch with us, support questions, all of the above, please direct them to the email address where we write that one, that one right there. So uh, reach out to us. Thank you so much for joining us again. Really appreciate it. Dan, thanks for being around. Kyle, thanks for pushing all the buttons. Uh, Jeff, Scott, and Brandon, thank you for your time, gentlemen. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks for having us, guys. Thank you, guys. Appreciate it. Thanks.